Welcome to Uninformed Summary, where four friends get together to discuss a person or event in history and its effect on us today. My name is Molly. Yeah, welcome. Welcome back, everyone. Hi, we're back. Hello. This week we have Matt in the hot seat. Yes, we do. Strap in, because this is a good one. Followed by none other than Vinny. I... Followed by Molly. Hello. And followed by me. Each one of us has done a different level of research. Matt doing the most research. Me doing the least research. Molly and Vinny having um, a little bit of research. And uh, yeah, this particular topic is very interesting to me because my great granddad fought in our topic today known as the Battle of the Bulge. Yep. Um, so it, the technical name of this event is the Ardennes Offensive, if you're an American. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge is kind of a name that the media gave it, but that's what it's popularly known by. And then if you're a German, you might know it as, un- I'm going to kill the German here, but <laughs> Unternehmen Wacht am Rhein, which means Operation Watch on, R- on the Rhine. That was their name for it. So the period we're covering here is 16 16 December to 25 January 1945. And this episode kind of builds on what we started talking about with the D-Day episode. Um, This is going to be the next major battle um, in World War II after D-Day. So just a real quick catch up to to bridge the two together. Um, We last left everybody. The Allied armies had just invaded D-Day and obtained a foothold from which they wouldn't be removed. And for there, it kind of settled into a long battle of attrition. Uh, the Germans d- didn't want to retreat. The Allies weren't going anywhere. And the, the country in Normandy, right around the beaches, kind of lent itself to a battle of attrition. It was what's there's something called bocage, which is like a way that the French farmers in Normandy divide up their fields. And it's like this real dense uh hedges like mixed with dirt it's like if you put up like a short dirt wall and then grew hedges into it and then surrounded your whole field with it so it kind of made every field into like a fortress it is not us the other army it is us the hedges haha <laughs> turn around please continue your business <laughs> yeah is this demarcating like battlefield lines with natural hedges and ditches no these hedges are like centuries old They go back to like the Middle Ages, um, which is why there's like so tough because like they're it's like I said, it's like an earth wall, but like a hedge has been growing on it for like 200 years. So it's like, you know, roots and and yeah, so it was just incredibly hard to get through. Um, And it like I said, it kind of devolved into this battle of attrition where, you know, the allies would slug forward and they would take another field and it would cost a bunch of casualties, but there'd be a bunch of German casualties too. So they were like inching forward, but they couldn't really break out. Uh, eventually, though, the Germans started running out of material for that battle of attrition. Um, the allies just had such an overwhelming advantage of material and men that they were able to push through and break out in Operation Cobra. And Operation Cobra just kind of blew the lid off everything like that. The Germans were like barely holding everything together with duct tape and Cobra just like <laughs> kicked the door in and broke everything apart. So they were, that led to a huge breakout that overran pretty much all of France. The Germans could never really get together a front line after that. Um, by August, almost all of, Ger- all of uh, France had been retaken. Paris had been liberated and the Allied armies were moving their way towards the German border. When they get to the German border, everything starts to kind of grind to a halt as the offensive runs out of gas, literally and figuratively. Um, At this point, they had not been able to take many major ports because part of the German strategy was to leave like garrisons behind in fortresses inside the the ports so that the allies couldn't take them. So in a lot of cases, they were taking gasoline for the frontline units on the German border all the way from like Cherbourg, or in some cases, even the D-Day beaches, those artificial harbors that we talked about, um, and driving it in trucks all the way to the German border to get fuel to the frontline units, which is like, as you can guess, incredibly wasteful. Like if you put fuel on a truck, you're burning fuel to get your fuel to the front line. So yeah, just think of the carbon footprint. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, and those Shermans do not get good gas mileage, let me tell you. You're saying this is during the winter, right? Yeah. Okay. Christmas time. Um, 
you didn't want to fall asleep or else you would die yeah for sure like yep. trench foot well there was there was one account where a soldier fought in the war without his shoes <laughs> Why? he survived well he just his his <laughs> socks were soaked so like trying to take care of himself in this thing but wow. then you know in an attack he fought without his shoes and so he's like dry enough socks by the fire and they're like put that fucking thing out everyone's gonna see he's like i can't man my socks are wet <laughs> boom incoming he just leaves them behind yeah you're not putting your boots back on <laughs> Probably no. couldn't, man. There was no. so like that offensive in particular. Yeah. <clears throat> Our den yeah. was such a surprise. They got they got pants down. Yep. Well, and they they're <laughs> heavy heavy machinery. Um, they're heavy guns. You'd have to only go through uh, like a do a three burst at a time, or else the gun would have completely melted in on itself because of the sheer number of people or enemy soldiers they were trying to Ooh, fight wow. so it's like mm -hmm. you and your your trench buddy are there and he's like okay i gotta do it you have to do it in burst of three you're gonna and melt then, the gun and if then you don't other dude is like no there's too many of them but oh <laughs> shit the gun won't work anymore because oh. i didn't listen to you hey is this <laughs> one that said it's basically an arcade game <laughs> Yeah, isn't that the, the alien invading game where you're like, beep, 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 beep. so I was right then, motherfuckers. Don't look at me like I'm dumb. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's like every it's every first person shooter, right? You gotta yeah. you, like you you use the 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 mounted machine gun too long and it it like mm -hmm. gets too hot and you can't shoot it again. That's based in reality. I mean, it's a thing. Mm, amazing. If this battle would have not happened, first person shooters would have gone way worse. <laughs> That's, I guess is what I'm taking away from this. And yeah. it's bothering me, actually, because this has been one of the few times that I've been in the uh, uninformed, uninformed seat and that you guys are talking. And I feel like I'm a kid at the, at the adults table. Like, I understand stocks and interest rates and mortgages. That's great. I'm a serious businessman. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, like so like uh, they uh, the vincent was alluding to um they allies kind of got caught with their pants down because at this point the assumption was that the war was won like it was a matter of time um before the war was going to be won and nobody knew when it was going to be won but i mean as far as everybody could tell the germans were beat and it was just a matter of you know taking all the territory and then the war would be over this is this is a lot to do with germans needing supplies desperately right yeah yeah, yeah, I mean, they're they're being strategic bombed at this point. They're fighting the Russians on the eastern front. They're fighting the allies in Italy. Um, yeah, they're they're in real bad shape. And, you know, in a lot of ways, they are kind of beat. I mean, you could definitely make the argument that after 1942, the Allies or the Axis were probably beat. And certainly by 1944, they, they were beat. The writing was on the wall. And just the material imbalance between the two sides meant that the Germans were never going to be able to win. Um, but as we're about to find out, the, the Germans had like one more last hurrah up their sleeve. And that's what this is. So um, this was all Hitler's idea uh, to counterattack in the West. Um, basically, he thought that if he got all of what was left of their armored forces, all of their best equipment and best troops together and put them all into one attack, maybe they could achieve something decisive. In this case, their plan was to drive a wedge between the British and the Americans, capture this major port of Antwerp, and maybe that would like scare them or, you know, demoralize the civilians back home and lead them to making a separate peace with Germany. And then once the allies were out of the way, then Germany could put everything on the Eastern front and maybe have a chance at stopping the Russians. So that was the idea. The problem um, with the Russians, though, is, is that Russians had a very powerful ally that has backed them up. I mean, it's probably one of the longest running ally ships that I can ever think of. Um, winter. That is the classic Russian thing. Yeah. Here's another fun fact. Um, allies had. Um, there was one point in this crazy battle that they actually used 
their like bayonets just like kamikaze ran to attack bayonet charge the, yeah they just scream in and this is like a lack of ammo run it, yeah finally it's all run it, attack yep. and yeah yep well it, it helps when you know that if you lose the battle you're going to go on war for or go on trial for massive war crimes i feel like that's <laughs> a pretty good uh reason to well die oh. here or die allied, later allied forces they, oh allied yeah. forces allied forces yeah. ran in with their bayonets and they yeah that was like the first time in a while that anything like that went down well i promise you i only have three more times i'm gonna miss hear what you guys have said tonight so i'm really excited <laughs> I'm counting. Who won, by the way? Do you exceed oh, your no, no spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Don't worry, Scoot. You, you you didn't do any research. It's fine. Yeah. You you have an excuse. Put your feet up, Scoot. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. Let me tell you, let me tell you a story. How far does this yeah. chair lean back? Go ahead. <laughs> so, like I said, um, the goal was to attack in the Ardennes, which is a densely forested and wooded area in Luxembourg and southern Belgium and eastern Germany. Um, and the Ardennes was a big part of this plan for a couple of reasons. One, um, in earlier in the war, in 1940, the Germans had a spectacular success attacking France. Uh, it led to the defeat of France pretty rapidly afterwards, where they attacked through the Ardennes and they swooped up and uh, encircled a large portion of the Allied army um, by attacking through the Ardennes, which... The Allies didn't expect because it's not very good tank country. It's got like hills and woods and not very many good roads. And um, so they didn't expect the Germans to come through there. So Hitler is like, well, it worked in 1940. Let's try it again in 1944. And they had a lot of the same thing, same advantages going for them in 1944 that they did in 1940. Um, the Allies did not think that the Germans would attack through the Ardennes because it seemed like a terrible place to attack because of the bad roads and stuff. So that the Allies kind of used it as a place where they could put new units to just like get worked up and where they could put units that were kind of fought out and short on men and uh, morale and they could recuperate there because it was like a quiet area of the front. Yeah, man, uh, a place that and I think the German forces knew the same thing. So like the tank commanders like understood that they were going to just be pushing past not meeting stiff resistance and so mm -hmm. it's just like even the shape of the line of combat after that it's a day right like within a day they've pushed how far um i'm not sure how many miles but yeah um it's they assume that, yeah the big old tanks <laughs> right <laughs> yeah it's hard to fight tanks when you don't have many tanks yourself <laughs> so doing okay sorry to do this i'm crude crude humor but the the research kept coming up with like uh, this battle historian talking about rapid armored thrusts <laughs> through the Arden. And it's like, yeah, he really did send as many good big tanks as he could to just steamroll. And a trait that tight end, you know? <laughs> he sure did. Try to find yeah. the hole and, you know. Anyway, sorry. I have a question, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so in I, in my experience of talking to you about uh, history, uh, there's always been, by both sides in some capacity, this kind of red herring-esque like, confusion uh, or attempt to confuse espionage, I guess, in a way, um, before going into the battle, like setting up fake you know, harbors and all that kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there any of that for this battle? Were they in, was there enough anticipation to be able to plant false information? And yeah, the Germans certainly tried. Um, they, but they weren't very good at it. They weren't near. We talked about it on D Day. The Allies were really good at it. The Germans were not very good at it. And one of the the biggest problems that the Germans had is that their radio code had been cracked, and they didn't realize it. So a lot of their radio transmissions were coming through and the allies were reading them. So the allies were reading stuff like division commanders that were worried about their timetables, like their units weren't moving fast enough, which is a weird thing to hear in like a defensive area, because if you're defending, everybody should already be where they are, right? There shouldn't be a bunch of people moving around. 
there are a bunch of planes coming into the, the, the German area. There's a bunch of armored units coming into the, the Ardennes area. And the, the Allied interception program called Ultra was letting the, the commanders in the area know. They're like, hey, this is all the stuff that we see that's going on. Um, and it's actually a big matter of controversy why they didn't respond to that better, why they didn't like put reinforcements into that area if they, they knew that an attack was coming. Uh, but the consensus seems to be that the Allied commanders just, again, they thought the Germans were beat. And they thought, okay, maybe they're like going to do a small counterattack or something like that, but it's nothing that we can't handle. The weather's bad. Um, the terrain is bad. There's snow on the ground. There's no way that they're going to try a, a big offensive right now in that spot. Hey, it's Christmas. Come yeah, on. that too. Yeah. Um, sure. So the Germans what, ran into the Russian army in winter and went, <laughs> okay, we got winners <laughs> on our side now. <laughs> So the Germans are able to mass a pretty pretty sizable force. They mass <laughs> over 400,000 men, about 1,400 tanks, tank destroyers and assault guns, 2,600 artillery pieces, 1,600 anti-tank guns, and about 1,000 combat aircraft. And that is by far the largest concentration that they'd put together in 1944. Um, so this is an impressive thing. I mean, you know, when the dictator decides that he wants to do something... It happens. And so they were able to get a lot of forces together for this thing. Right. They did top brass of Germany's like kind of shivering too. There was a failed assassination attempt, right? Mm -hmm. In the same year. Right. And oh, also the guy's nutso and will mm -hmm. like, you know, slice your freaking ears off if you are accused of not listening or something. He's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, he just he just purged a bunch of generals because of that plot. Exactly. Just like you said. Exactly. So nobody's really in the mood to tell gonna... Hitler no right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. He's going to be like, oh, so maybe 100,000 planes, maybe we scale that back? No? Okay, no, that's cool. No, yeah, that's fine. To. We'll do it your way. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so the initial attack comes on 16 December. And like Vinny said, uh, initially it is very successful. Um, the Germans have surprise on their side, they have concentration on their side, and they have bad weather on their side, which is one of the things that this plan hinged on. Because if the weather is bad, then the Allies can't use their massive, overwhelming air superiority uh, to blunt the attack. So the attack jumps off, and, and although they made good gains, the Americans, there are tons of stories of heroism. Um, like Molly said, there's just crazy stuff that these under-equipped and in a lot of cases had never seen battle before unit um, put up crazy stands like just to pull a few of the best examples um, on the north part of the bulge there's a single INR platoon which is information and reconnaissance so this is like not even a frontline unit they're just there basically like as a outpost in case any German attack did come and there's 18 men in this platoon and for a whole day they held up a battalion of 500 Germans uh, basically with a couple machine guns um, and threw the whole timetable off in that sector by a whole day, just 18 guys. Um, also in the northern part of the sector, um, there are troops from the segregated 578th Field Artillery Battalion, which was an African-American unit. A lot of people don't know that there were African-American units involved in World War II, um, but there were. And they were a field artillery unit, so they were originally in the rear part of the, the battlefield, but... The German penetration was such that they became on the front line and they picked up rifles and they supported the infantrymen of the, the 106th Division and again, slowed down the German timetable. And all over the front, Americans were doing whatever they could with whatever they could to throw the Germans timetable off. Uh, there's they collapsed overpasses and bridges, they mined roads and they burnt uh, fuel supplies as the Germans advanced, which was key because a key part of the German plan was to actually capture a bunch of fuel because the Germans were really short on gasoline at this point and they didn't have enough to even get to Antwerp um, in their supply units. So they were relying on capturing gasoline from the Americans as they advanced. So burning that gas was uh, a, a big, big part of throwing their uh, timetable off. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. I'm thinking just classic Americans, just burning gas all over the free world. And the tyranny world. But that, okay, okay, so from a German perspective at the time, being the tank troop or whatever, you're rolling up and you're like, this is going great. 
<laughs> we're gonna get all this gas oh <laughs> he's like a huge like depot of gas <laughs> just burning in front of you like oh, okay well maybe we'll get the next one. Oh, uh -huh. shiza <laughs> <laughs> they just keep burning it <clears throat> Yeah, and that's basically how it happens. They've been they've been awake for like three days, you know, like force marching and like force driving and on German mm -hmm. meth and stuff. It's yeah. very that's that's got to be hell. If they were less racist. They could have been friends with Saudi Arabia, but no, dude, they were so racist. They they took that three thirty third. That why you know, what this, what happened? They, 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 oh, bad. Did <laughs> bad something bad. happen? Torture, that's a different. That's a different episode. Yeah, it's a whole yeah, it's a whole thing. But they basically um, had a take no prisoners approach to kind of condense that narrative. Yep. Yeah, there are a number of massacres um, in the early part of the attack because they uh, they didn't want to take any prisoners because it might slow them down. They were on a tight timetable. Well, you also talked about that too, Matt. That like the writing was on the wall for the Germans. But I mean, was there that sense of overconfidence at least in the higher up management? I think we could name at least one person. Um, Maybe just that, one. <laughs> at least one um, that did not see that, like, did not see that failure was an option or was. Oh, for I mean, sure. We... Yeah. Um, like, it's like what Vinny alluded to with the, the plot to assassinate Hitler that had just happened and Hitler had purged a lot of generals that he felt weren't loyal enough to him. And so most of the people in charge uh, in high positions for the Battle of the Bulge on the German side were people that were fanatically devoted to Hitler. So like uh, the leader of the second SS Panzer Corps, which is one of the, the main units in the attack is led by a guy named Sepp Dietrich. And you can go back and forth on whether or not he was actually a good general, but what everybody can agree on is that he was a huge piece of shit. Um, he was 100% <laughs> in on the Nazi thing. Um, and <laughs> oh, yeah, my goodness. And, and it was his troops that were going to commit a lot of these massacres during the, during the battle. And it's because they were, they were fanatical Nazis. So yeah, that, that was definitely a factor. Amazing. Yeah. So as the attack progresses, the, the troops that are there, are doing whatever they can to slow the Germans down. And meanwhile, the, the Allied High Command is realizing what's happening, and they realize that this is a major attack. So Eisenhower, our uh, subject from the D-Day the episode, calls a conference at Verdun and gets all of his generals together and says, the first thing out of his mouth is, quote, the present situation is to be regarded as one of opportunity for us and not disaster. There will be only cheerful faces at this conference table. So he realized right away that this was not... This was not the Germans weren't going to be able to probably get very far. And this was an opportunity for them to shorten the war. And Patton, realizing what Eisenhower was implying, responded, quote, hell, let's have the guts to let the bastards go all the way to Paris. Then we'll really cut them off and chew them up. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, question, because historically uh -huh. this is hard. You, you guys know how it's hard to you get a text from someone you haven't talked to in a while. It's, maybe they make a jokey comment, but you don't try to interpret that. Like, are they serious? Are they really fine LMAO? Why would you LMAO if you're fine? I don't get it. So like historically, I have that concern with like these quotes. Are they just cool with it as they sound? Or is that sarcasm like that I'm not picking up on? Well, as far as what Eisenhower is saying? Yeah, they just cool. Like, nah, they'd be all right. Let them go. And then we'll, then we'll actually pincer them off or something. Is that? Yeah. It seems cavalier. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does seem cavalier, but I mean, these are the top level guys. And I think it's more it's. I mean, my reading of it is a the Eisenhower does recognize there's an opportunity, but also he opens the conference that way because he wants to stop anybody from panicking. You know what I mean? Because there, right. there are some That's people so at the table that are extremely worried. I mean, there's confusing reports coming out from the front. This is the first major German offensive in forever when we thought that they were beat. And so a lot of people are kind of freaking out. And, you know, the tendency might be, let's just like shove reinforcements in the way of the attack and stop it. You know what I mean? Um, let's just stop it and restabilize the line and then then go back to what we were doing. But the the minds like Eisenhower and Patton are realizing this is an opportunity. This is kind of a foolish attack in a lot of ways. And it might be an opportunity for us to to shorten the war by cutting off these units that are making this weird attack. I wonder how super valuable that cracked code was. Oh, yeah, it's like super right valuable. Yeah. That. Oh, we know. It's like you. OK, if you have risk or it's like saying battleship, but I'm going to look at your board, too. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'd have a, yeah. you'd have a pretty good game, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's also the talent too. I mean, Patton and Eisenhower say what you will about them. We're very, very talented at what they do. So like, you know, I don't know if you've, you've like played games against people and watch somebody that's way better at a game, like say chess than somebody who's not. And Okay, say I the feel less... personally attacked, Matt. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Our games of chess have gone completely one to one, one directionally. So, so I'll use a personal example since Scott brought it up. So it's like Scott... watching me play chess versus Matt play chess is what yeah. I think is what I'm gathering. So Scott would mount an attack of some sort and it would look dangerous. Like he would gain some material. He would gain a position that looked threatening, but to a more experienced player and especially a player like in this case where the U.S. Army literally like has more pieces than the German Army. Um, so it's not even fair to begin with. They're like, yeah, that looks a little threatening to maybe the pawns that are getting taken right now. But if you look at the big picture for a second, you realize that it's utterly foolish. It's going to end in defeat and we can make an opportunity out of this. Sorry, Scott. It's fine. You're playing with more pieces, man. I get it. Now it makes a lot of sense. I thought I was doing great. Jumpy, jumpy, horsey thing. <laughs> I so got Pat the gist of it. So Patton, who's, who's the big brain Matt in this scenario, to continue <laughs> using this, this uh, metaphor, um, he, before going to this conference, already gave his, his uh, subordinates orders to start moving north, to start attacking the edge of the, the German uh, bulge to try and cut the people off there. Um, and he told everybody there that he could be attacking with two divisions in 48 hours, which shocked everybody. Um, but he had already started work on these plans because he knew that that would probably be the best thing to do. That was amazing. It's like fighting a blitz with another blitz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of just defending, they're going to counterattack. So the Allies did rush reserves to the area to hold the shoulders of the penetration. So if you, you look at the bulge and it's like... A, you know, a, a a bump sticking out of a, a straight line. Um, they, oh, this they're, is fun. They're holding. I'm sure Scott will put graphics on <laughs> in the in the notes for the YouTube. I got um, John Holmes googling right now. Oh no! Yeah, he just keeps sending me emojis. Yeah. So what I they're going to do? I don't think the video version of this is going to do all that great on YouTube, but uh, for me, it'll <laughs> it, it's art, motherfuckers. So they rush reserves to the area and they want to hold the shoulders, uh, which are the the part near where the line meets the part that's bulging out so that the bulge can't get any wider. It can get deeper <laughs> and longer. And harder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's not going to get any wider. So it's all I've, length. I know. It's, it's all, length, all length and no girth. Um, right. And that's okay. and that's the key. So the allies are rushing reinforcements to the area to hold the, sh the shoulders of it, of the area and also to hold these key road junctions. Um, so again, like the way, best way I can describe it is like, I don't know if you've ever been to West Virginia or Kentucky, but like the roads can only go through certain areas, like the bottom of the valley, right? There's no other road. So if you hold that city where the road junction is, there's no real good way to get around it. I mean, you'd have to like drive up you know, a hill and go around. And that's no way to like get supplies forward to your troops and everything. So the allies hang on to these key road junctions and the most famous of which is Bastogne. Uh, it was defended by the 101st Airborne Division, which everybody knows about, but also the all African-American 969th Artillery Battalion and Combat Command B of the 10th Armor Division. So pretty early in the battle, Bastogne gets completely surrounded. Um, they're cut off from supplies, but they're they're ordered to hold in the town uh, to keep the Germans from having access to the road network. Um, conditions get pretty bad in there. Um, they do parachute in some supplies, but food and medicine run short. So does ammunition, like Molly was talking about earlier. Um, so they're barely hanging on. Um, and on December 22nd, so this is five, six days into the attack, uh, the, the, the German that was commanding the siege of Bastogne dispatched a party consisting of a major lieutenant and two enlisted men under a flag of truce to deliver an ultimatum to the defenders of Bastogne. Um, so this is the letter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote verbatim because this is a famous moment in American history and the history of the Airborne Corps. Um, this is the note that the, that the German commander wrote. To the USA commander of the encircled town of Bastogne, the fortune of war is changing. 
This time, the USA forces in and near Bastogne have been encircled by strong German armored units. More German armored units have crossed the river near Orthville, have taken Marsh, and reached St. Hubert by passing through Ampre Sibre Tile. Libremont is in German hands. There is only one possibility to save the encircled USA troops from total annihilation. That is the honorable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over, a term of two hours will be granted, beginning with the presentation of this note. If this proposal should be rejected, one German artillery corps and six heavy AA battalions are ready to annihilate the USA troops in and near Bestone. The order for firing will be given immediately after this two-hour term. All the serious civilian losses caused by this artillery fire would not correspond with the well-known American humanity. Signed, the German commander. So, I, I, I have already done uh, the editing for the thumbnail for this episode, um, but uh, there is images that you can look up online, and uh, I know that there was um, a thought of possibly adding that encircled area uh, into the thumbnail. Um, I just, unfortunately, I decided to go a different direction. But yeah, you can definitely tell in that offensive uh, that's coming from the Germans through, that, through the bulge is it's just like it looks like a lone island. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the the American uh, commander reads this. His name is General McAuliffe. And uh, funnily enough, he was not even the commanding general of the 101st Division. The actual commanding general was at a meeting in England when this all went down. They got rushed to the front, took up positions in Bastogne, and before you know it, they're isolated. So he is acting commander um, kind of by accident. So they get this message, you know, this elaborate, you know, well thought out and detailed, you know, demand to surrender from the Germans. Um, mm -hmm. And McAuliffe, according to how the story goes, reads it, crumples it into a ball, throws it in the trash can and says, ah, nuts. <laughs> and so <laughs> he walks out of the room and the rest of his staff is sitting there like, so how the fuck do we respond to this thing? <laughs> and as the story goes, Lieutenant Colonel Harry, Harry Kennard suggested that, well, what the general said might be good enough. And so they penned this message to the German commander, nuts, the American commander. <laughs> wow. wow. Fantastic, right? What a, what a reply to mm -hmm. just kind of back up that idea that from the top down, Matt said that that confidence was key here. Yeah. Pretty confident. That, that does. It sounds like you're just <laughs> going into this saying it's open and shut. Do your thing. Come on through. We're just going to stop you when you run out of gas. Yeah, so it's kind of funny that the 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 kind of after after story to the to that whole story is that so the they give the message to the German guys and the German guys take it back um, with an American um, in case they need help translating and they get back there to the German commanding officer and they're like nuts what the hell does this mean <laughs> and the the American that went back with him is like well it kind of means something like F you. <laughs> yeah, because I was going to say, I, I've spent a considerable amount of time on Reddit, and I see threads on there where, like, people that are not normal English-speaking people hear, you know, phrases that we use, and they get really confused, like, oh, what does that mean? Um, right. So, I mean, it was the equivalent to being sent back, you know, like, getting a message that says, you know, uh, avocado. Right. Yeah, you know, there's no understanding to that as to why right. it's used in a traditional phrase. Yeah, if you just translate it literally, it means nothing, right? Like, <laughs> nuts. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> but yeah, so they get the message. Um, the annihilating artillery barrage that the Germans promised never really materialized um, is kind of an empty threat, and Bastogne was never taken. Um, so all the German supplies to the rest of the battle had to go around the city, like we said, up through hills, through bad roads in the winter. Um, so, yeah, it was a key moment in the battle. Wait, my grandpa wasn't lying when he said uphill both ways in the winter, negative yeah. no 150 boots. degrees, no, no shoes, socks. no socks. <laughs> Couldn't even yeah. get your socks out of the way of the artillery. <clears throat> yeah, man, yeah, I was so... watching this amazing, like, tank-on-tank -tank fighting stuff that was happening, and I won't, I'm sorry to interject, like, no, right go for it. There. Yeah. But just it was amazing hearing that these tanks had to drive all the way up, you know, overnight from the Allied side after this command was given to to meet the the assault. And then then they were just super, like out tanked as well, because these German tigers 
and the German, what, they were panzers, right? And tigers. Mm-hmm. They all had cat names. Yep. <laughs> but the tiger was the big daddy. And like, it's like armor is 100 millimeters thick, which is basically impenetrable by any tank shell that American tanks and like allied tanks had, right? Mm-hmm. For the most part, so, yeah. So what were they supposed to do when they got there? That's what I keep thinking about. If, you, if you're like, all right, drive your tank real fast up to meet those German tanks. Okay, but you know we can't shoot through them. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, I mean, just... <clears throat> basically the tactic was to try and get a side or back shot where the armor wasn't quite so thick, um, or to get some sort of like what in tanker terms you'd call a mobility kill, which is like knock the, tra- the tread off of it so that it can't move. So it's like yeah. it's still the people in there are still alive, but the tank's not much good with no treads. Right. Um, or you can get what's called like an operational kill, which is where the tank isn't destroyed, but like you blind it or damage its main gun or jam its turret or something like any number of those things will make a, a, a tank basically useless, even if it's not destroyed. Kind of going on further on that, the documentary stuff I got into talked about this German tank team and they had orders. Think about this battle of the bulge mentality. Right? You're not going to stop till it's over. So they had commands from their tank gods, commanders, whatever, that you couldn't get out of your German tank unless it was on fire. It was the only like excuse that tank crews had to get out. Interesting. So yeah, so this one tank sustained 22 American white phosphorus shells. Oh, jeez. Every couple, yeah, like every like what half a minute or however long it takes to load up and re-aim. Yeah. Again, that's wild. 22 times the whole tank's on fire. Their boots are melting. And then oh. their commander's like, all right, I guess we can go and get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, since your, like since, every boss. Since your boots are melting, I guess you can get out. <clears throat> and fantastic. Like, uh, these were the stakes, you know, last. Right. Ditch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so by the time uh, Best Stone, that's all going on in Best Stone, um, the weather had also cleared, which was causing huge problems for the Germans. Allied air power just had free reign to do whatever it wanted. Um, the Germans, who were already having trouble getting supplies forward, had even more trouble getting supplies forward. Um, and so given the, the weather clearing and the, the, the way that the Allies reacted to it, the Germans were unable to meet their objectives. And furthermore, thanks to Patton's foresight and Ike's recognition of the opportunity to cut off the German forces, the Germans now are not only facing the, the failure of their offensive, but they're faced with the prospect of another disaster, like the one that happened in France earlier that year, um, where they might be surrounded and cut off and everybody killed or captured. And then by January 7th, um, Hitler finally agreed to withdraw all of the forces from the Ardennes. He his generals have been asking for that sooner because they realized that the writing was on the wall, the offensive had failed, and they just wanted to get everybody out before they could be encircled. Um, and it wasn't until January 7th that Hitler finally uh, agreed to withdraw all forces uh, from the Ardennes. So uh, when, we were, when we were prepping for this episode, Scott asked the question, so given that this was a kind of a recreation of, of an attack in 1940, why did it work so well in 1940 and not 1944? So I just wanted to take a second to kind of give an analysis of that. Um, part of it was Allied air power. Um, the Allied air power was weak in 1940, but in 1944, it was just like absolutely dominant. Like, it's hard for me to express how dominant Allied air power was at this point in the war. Um, basically, they could do whatever they want. There were Allied fire bombers flying overhead all the time. And as soon as any American just about saw a target and they, if they had a radio they could call in fire bombers to drop bombs and strafe anything that they saw um you couldn't move during the daylight if you were a german for the most part along a road because just there were swarms of fighter bombers flying everywhere and you'd get shot up there are numerous german generals that were killed in their staff cars including yeah. erwin rommel yeah. was basically killed he wasn't quite killed but uh he eventually died um and it's because his staff car was shut up while he's trying to fl- to drive around and figure out what was going on in his sector. Um, so the air power was a huge part of it. The second part of it was the conditions of battle. So in 1940, what the Germans did was they went through the Ardennes and then they fought their way to the coast. So there were no allied troops in the Ardennes for the most part. There was like a little bit, but for the most part, they just drove through the Ardennes and then attacked. 
Whereas in 1944, they had to fight inside the Ardennes. So in 1940, there was no 101st Airborne defending Bastogne. They just drove through Bastogne. And in 1944, there was troops defending Bastogne, and they couldn't capture it. And that was like a huge part of why, why the wheels fell off. Um, kind of, <clears throat> if you took out one big hub of a wheel, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And then lastly, just like in 1940, surprise and novelty favored the Germans. Um, and in 1944, despite, you know, some of the failings that we talked about with Allied intelligence, not realizing that the attack was coming, um, it, it still wasn't decisive enough that they were able to break through. So that's my quick analysis on why it worked in 1940 and why it didn't work in 1944. So America, you're welcome, yeah. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And. Yeah. So that's a Scott's dad, a Scott, not Scott's dad, Scott's grandpa. Um, I mean, battle. if you found him, I would like to know <laughs> where he is. That'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah, no, my, my great grandpa uh, Paul fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And I like to tell the story uh, typically because it doesn't sound like a real thing. Um, but he was driving something, hit a landmine, no. and... Uh, it fucked up his vision. They still made him serve on guard duty that night. Um, but it fucked up his vision uh, that uh, changed his um, reds to look green and his greens to look red. And so when he got back, uh, it ruined his chance of, you know, um, being an Uber driver. Um, because no one would ride in the car with him. <laughs> um so, yeah, and it was actually, I want to thank Matt because Matt was able to teach me a lot of things about my grandpa, uh, my great grandfather. I did not know, like one uh, that uh, everyone in my family got his birthday wrong. That was the big one. Um, but he, you, you were actually able to find it. And you actually by some of the research you gave me, I found out he uh, owned a, a, a boat, uh, a fishing boat in Florida. I knew he lived in Florida. I knew he was a fisherman, but I didn't. I mean, I guess I just kind of thought like you know, go get a rod and reel and drink beer. And that's where all the country songs come from is my great grandfather. Um, but yeah, so I got to learn a bunch of stuff and there's a lot of things out there that if, uh, if you're listening and you happen to have family members that were uh, enlisted in the uh, great war of world war two, uh, you can easily find that just email Matt, uh, Matt, Matt, <laughs> or, would love nothing. or maybe we could put the link in the, in the description. <laughs> That sounds complicated. So you can email Matt at Matt at uninformed summary dot com. We don't own that, but eventually we will. Just keep so, emailing. Yeah. I'd yeah. Email. It'll eventually show up. And, and he knows everyone's great grandparents. So, yes. Yeah. He's it's surprising how much he knows. So we've talked uh, about the in the last World War Two episode, the Eisenhower episode was that that we all had the uh, family members involved, <clears throat> you know, Mm -hmm. Must have been fantastic uh, to be like hearing about that as it's happening on radio. Like, oh, we're doing it. We're they're finally done. We're finishing this battle. Um, because that's it. They can't do anything more after that. Yeah, Turn, there's right? nothing after that. You yep. know, there was war no <laughs> war is over. We don't have to do anything else. Yeah, we're all good now. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't over, but it was for sure at last the beginning of the end, um, which moves right into my my legacy part of the of the the story, which is overall the Ardennes offensive didn't really accomplish much. I mean, it's a big, famous battle. Um, and a lot of that was because of the media coverage that it got at the time, because, again, we thought, you know, the war was won. So it was weird and alarming in a lot of ways that the Germans were doing this offensive. And there were a lot of American casualties. This was like the highest casualty battle in American history um, as far as uh, wounded and dead in one battle. So and not to minimize that. Um, 80, 000, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was horrific. Germans had like a hundred thousand. Yeah. Ugh. Like those, those units that were doing that, that brave defending at the beginning of the battle to slow the Germans down, paid a heavy, heavy price. So yeah. um, it's not to mem minimize any of that, but I mean, that just highlights the futility of it all because it never came anywhere near capturing Antwerp. Um, they never even got close. Um, the Allies never wavered in their commitment to defeating Germany together. It's, it's, I mean, it's, as soon as it happened, they just got, they put their heads together and, and figured out how to do it. They even gave um, the, the British general, 
Field Marshal Montgomery, they gave him command of a couple of American armies to help out and British units helped out. And it was, you know, it was an allied thing. They fought it together. And uh, and in the end, it didn't accomplish much. It, it killed a lot of people and it used up like most of what was left of the German armor to mechanize his forces, fuel reserves and aircraft. So they yeah. were kind of worse off than when they started. And it ruined Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, terrible Christmas. I mean, who wants to fight for Christmas? I think about well, that in context a lot, though. You know, just as a person-to-person level, we there's a historical lens which we see these things through, and then there's like Molly made that allusion to a person who did not have boots. So there's a humanization. I mean, he had boots, but they weren't on his feet. When he yeah, right. that's what I mean. Like he yeah, listed yeah, with right. no shoes on. <laughs> I can't try to give him a pair, and he's like, "I don't believe in shoes." Yeah. Better I'm gonna kill an ass. He's barefoot. And he said, "I can't." And that was three hours in, I think. Which is yeah. incredible. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people that thought they weren't on the front line found themselves on the front line all of a sudden. So, yeah, stuff like that happened. Um, so yeah, um, Winston Churchill, because you got to break out a Winston Churchill quote in any history podcast um he said addressing the the house of commons following the battle of the bulge that quote this is undoubtedly the greatest american battle of the war and will i believe be regarded as an ever famous american victory and i mean aside from being a nice thing to say about his ally it also kind of signaled that this was kind of the first time that it was a mostly american battle so we talked about on d-day how of the five beaches uh, there was two American, two British, and one Canadian. So it's like a you know almost a fifty fifty split with the one Canadian. So it's like you know it's an Allied effort. Whereas if you look at all the units that were involved in the Battle of the Bulge, it's very very little British involvement, and that's not an accident. By this point in the war, the British were running out of manpower, and the Americans were taking a larger and larger part of the war effort, and. You know, that has ramifications when it comes to the post-war period. You know, Britain was an empire on the wane. And after World War II, America is the empire on the ascent. So um, it's kind of a a big tipping point um, as far as that relationship between those two allies in in the war in Europe. So America. Yeah. Yeah. Even in the French forest. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Happy July 10th. Well, uh, I'm definitely... (laughs) <laughs> I'm definitely afraid to ask, but uh, did you want to list any of your sources? Uh, I imagine you've gained a lot of this information over the course of your 300 years on this planet. Yeah, a lot of it is uh, just off the top of my head. I did read uh, reread portions of The Bitter Woods, which is a book by uh, John or Dwight Eisenhower's son. So that seemed particularly appropriate uh, since we talked about his dad in the previous episode. Right. Um, yeah, I used Wikipedia just for like facts and figures and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the the source was just my brain. <laughs> That's how we do it uh, when well when history is always on your mind, right? You're so that, impressive, Matt. Thank that you. will definitely be written in the uh, description. Is this this week's sources were Matt's brain and a little That's bit cool. of Wikipedia. I have to um, look at my Chicago Manual style because I'm not sure how you cite somebody's brain as a source, but. His brain dick? You gotta underline would it, be, it. Would it be brain dick? Brain dick? Matt's big brain dick. <laughs> big brain dick energy? Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> how you know. He gives, re- gives me a real battle of the bulge. Ah. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah! All right, well, well with that said, week. guys... <laughs> good job, yeah. good job, Matt. That was really good. Thank you. Very well done. Uh, th- that will conclude our episode on the Battle of the Bulge. If you'd like to follow Matt, follow Matt at Matchroll20. You can follow uh, Molly at Mallswald, M O L S W A L D. You can follow me at That One Loud Guy. And uh, uh, Vinny, did you get a Twitter? Uh, nope. No, you can still. I, I did go back to hacking Ted Cruz's Twitter, so you can follow me at Ted Cruz. <laughs> There we go. Twitter. I'll respond to anything you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, make certain to follow Vinny at Ted Cruz. Uh, I, I do want to say that we've got some exciting things coming in the next few weeks. Uh, we are launching a new channel, which we will talk about at some point. 
Um, we are also launching a new series that will be exclusive to the YouTube channel for now. At some point, we'll look at maybe putting it on the podcast and uh, more of that will come. Uh, at least information about that will come uh, in the form of no information. We're just going to post it and see what the fuck happens. Um, <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that's the plan. Uh, we have a very good marketing team and they said, don't do that. And I said, I think I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna see where that takes us. So stay tuned, make certain you definitely like, and subscribe. Lean in, lean in Thank you guys life. so much. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you guys next week. Bye. Much. So we're, your bucket. funding's up for its annual review. And yeah. according to these notes, it just looks like you guys have been dropping acid and giving dolphins hand jobs. That so, is not all we have been doing. We have and, found a way to pit, play Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon underwater. Dolphins love sex. <laughs> oh, I mean, because that's why she... different dolphins make different tones when you jerk them off. <laughs> <laughs> they probably do, because dolphins yep. have... They have like names. Was it A B C D E F G? Uh, so there's like five <laughs> flats. Okay, so however many that is, that's how many dolphins we got. We have an extra one <laughs> if we want to make it sound like harmony. It's mostly the D chord. Get it? Okay. Oh, uh, we were looking for an A sharp, but we just gave that dolphin the D. <laughs>